Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. We really appreciate you joining our webinar today, Investing in Yourself, Lifelong Learning as the New Normal. I am honored to be joined by two incredible colleagues and what have become friends through this process, um, who we'll be introducing here in a minute. I wanted to take a moment to thank Kelly Brown and A.B. Greensfelter for joining our discussion along with Peggy Bishop Lane from the Wharton School. Um, before we begin, just a few technical details. Uh, those of you that are joining us today are in listen-only mode. Uh, we, however, want you to be part of our discussion today. I'll be moderating. My name is Alex Bramfrey. I'm co-founder here at Ivy Exec. Um, and I'll be checking very regularly the chat box to see if there are any questions that you have for Kelly and Abby as we have our discussion today, uh, which will take the form of a panel discussion, a virtual firefight, a, wire, a fireside chat of, of sorts, if you will. Um, we'll be together for approximately an hour. Um, we have a few discussion questions that we would like to uh, discuss as a group. Um, and again, we would like to encourage you to be part of our discussion throughout. Um, and before we begin, um, I'll quickly hand it over to Peggy Bishop Lane from the Wharton School to say a few words and to introduce our panelists for today. Peggy? Great, thank you, Alex, and welcome everybody to today's webinar sponsored by the Wharton MBA Program for Executives. I'm Dr. Peggy Bishop Lane, the Vice Dean of the Program and an Accounting Professor here at Wharton. The Wharton MBA Program for Executives is one of two ways a student can earn the Wharton MBA degree. Our program is suited to mid-level and executive level professionals in a variety of fields, functions, and industries, including media, finance, government, healthcare, engineering, and entrepreneurship. The program is offered in an every other weekend format in Philadelphia and San Francisco. Today, we are pleased to have two of our marvelous alumni to address today's topic, investing in yourself, lifelong learning as the new normal. Kelly Brown is the founder of BSD Strategy Group, a people interaction design firm that helps law firms and other organizations implement strategies that bring people together across differences in ways that build inclusive work communities. As a lawyer and former law executive, many times Kelly was the only person of color at the decision-making table. At the same time, she has experienced the power of inclusion and working together across differences to realize the benefits of diversity. As a person of mixed race, at a young age, she had to learn to navigate the complexities of building bridges across differences, which inspired a lifelong interest in human connection and collaboration. Abby Greensfelder is the founder and CEO of Every Woman Studios, a full service media company with a mission to tell female focused, female driven stories, creating positive cultural impact. The company's first feature documentary, LFG, chronicles the U.S. women national soccer team's fight for equal pay, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2021, and is now streaming on HBO Max. She's also the co-founder of Half Yard Productions, an award-winning production company specializing in non-fiction series and documentaries, including Say Yes to the Dress, How the States Got Their Shapes, and the last Alaskans. While at Discovery, Abby was named one of the Hollywood Reporter's Next Generation 35 Under 35. Abby also serves on the board of the Alliance for Women in Media and is a limited partner at Rethink Impact. I'm excited to hear from these two Wharton Executive MBA graduates in their discussion with Alex Barampuria, co-founder and chief growth officer of Ivy Exec. Alex, take it away. Thank you, Peggy, for those welcome remarks. And Kelly, Abby, like I said, I'm excited to be part of our discussion today. Thanks for Thank you. Me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so um, we have a few discussion questions. And again, we want to encourage our attendees to, to participate. And um, just to put a little bit of the context for why we wanted to be together today, um, our, our discussion is entitled Investing in Yourself, Lifelong Learning as the new normal. Um, and one of the inspirations behind this topic was really what I think we've all seen over the past year and a half, two years is the extreme sort of transformation through technology of nearly every facet of our world and particularly of our economy. And what we've learned is that 
we all must learn new skills um, and acquire knowledge at a pace and at a scale that I think we've never seen before. And companies are looking for in this uh, world that we are in uh, for intellectual and leadership dexterity, uh, just as much as we're looking at technical expertise in the face of increased automation. And as we all know, the future of work um, looks a lot different now um, than what it might have looked like in our eyes just a year and a half, two years ago. We thought this was an important discussion to have uh, as we sort of enter into what the future of work will continue to evolve into and really look at and sort of ask the question around which skills are most critical for today's business leaders and where should executives go to develop themselves? Um, Abby and Kelly, I would certainly say from, you know, the conversations that we have had, you operate with a lifelong learning mindset. And I'm very honored to have both of you be part of this discussion as two incredibly successful women, both uh, alum of Wharton. And to sort of kick this discussion off a little bit for our audience, um, um, I thought it would be important to just give a little bit of a sense of I as a moderator, what my mindset has been when it comes to lifelong learning. Um, internally within our leadership team at Ivy Exec, we've continuously discussed this topic of what lifelong learning looks like. And we discussed the discomfort uh, of operating with a lifelong learning mindset in a way, uh, a lifelong learning mindset in a way sort of requires us to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's at least what we concluded. I'd love to sort of toss that sort of question over to, to you, Abby and Kelly, to sort of kick us off what does a lifelong learning mindset mean to you? Um, how has that mindset played out in your career? And just to recap some of the details that Peggy shared, Kelly, you've served as chief of staff to uh, the chair of a top 50 law firm. Um, you were one of the few women at the executive table. You led DEI strategy uh, and impacted many organizations. You are a fellow entrepreneur. Uh, and one that's acquired incredible experiences, learning experiences through your law degree and through your executive MBA at Wharton. Um, perhaps you can kick it off for us, Kelly. What does that leadership mindset look like for you? And we'll pass that question over to Abby as well. Sure. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so happy to be here with you and Abby uh, and um, happy with everyone who's joining us. So, um, I mean, really, I was thinking about what you said about this idea of um, kind of discomfort and and being comfortable with the uncomfortable and um, so when I think about kind of this learning you know mindset or this lifelong learning mindset I really feel like I was fortunate um, early in my career I mean right out of law school my first um, job at a law firm I uh, through a formal mentoring program I was assigned a mentor and I really thank my lucky stars because he um, had a sense of humor, so <laughs> it made it not as intimidating, right? I felt like I could talk to him and connect with him. Um, but also, he was a great teacher. I mean, he really was not only an amazing practitioner, uh, but he was a great teacher. And so one of the things that he mentioned to me early on, and it stuck with me all these years later, I mean, throughout my life, um, is he would say that, look, Kelly, as you're building your career as a lawyer, when you're when you're working on something right a project um every time you start getting comfortable whether it's a particular project or a type of work that is the time that is like the signal when you need to actually find a different type of project so my area of work um was real estate particularly real estate finance but even within that realm there are all kinds of deals there's all different types of deals and different types of tasks and projects and so, um, and what he was saying is the the um, the temptation is actually going to be once you start feeling comfortable, particularly as a young lawyer, you're going to want to stick with that because you're going to feel like finally I feel competent, <laughs> you know, doing something out of law school. Um, he said, but that you want to really resist that feeling. You want every mm -hmm. time you know you start getting comfortable to say, you know, now it's time. I need to look for that next project. Um, what makes me feel uncomfortable? And so I just, I've really applied that actually to life, right? So um, whenever I'm, whether it's been a particular, you know, position in my career, um, you know, moving actually from practicing law to outside of law, more into law firm management, 
it was always this time period where I started feeling like, okay, I'm feeling good about what I'm doing. I'm liking it, feeling kind of comfortable, but I think, you know what, let me, I think it's time to try something new. Um, mm. And then the more you do it, at least what I have found, there's still that discomfort, but you kind of adjust to it more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just to build upon this idea of when you feel a certain level of certainty and a certain level of muscle memory in a way, there's a certain signal that might go off. And that's the part that may not be natural for some, it might be for others. And um, I remember watching a Netflix documentary and I'm gonna sort of toss this over to Abby as, as, as a transition. Um, the documentary was talking about the, the creative journey and that oftentimes new creative things come from prior experiences and prior data points products or services and it's just sort of viewed from a slightly different perspective and as i sort of think about this idea of being comfortable with discomfort and sort of one pushing themselves towards a lifelong learning mindset a lifelong learning mindset doesn't necessarily mean you're starting from scratch like you've done kelly take what you have done and perhaps applying it in a slightly different manner creates that sense of discomfort, but you're leveraging what you've experienced, what you have seen without starting from ground zero. So I'll, I'll use that almost as a way, as a baseline of what you described, Kelly, um, and to sort of ask the same question to you, Abby. You're a former network executive and production company head. You, like Kelly, um, are an entrepreneur in a, in, a, in a sense. You've launched Every Woman, your second big sort of entrepreneurial venture after seeing the massive gender gap in the entertainment ecosystem like like peggy described um, you've launched an accelerator program which is very inspiring in many ways for female creators and are also a venture capitalist so from your perspective from your experiences abby what has that leader, leader uh learning lifelong learning mindset looked for, looked like for you as a leader that's just striving to do more yeah i love i love kelly's frame of like sitting in the uncomfortability. Um, I think that for me, I think sometimes we have this notion, like as a storyteller, I'm somebody, I believe in the power of stories. Sometimes we create our own narratives about ourselves, like our careers, that, oh, we always thought, you know, that we would end up where we are now. Well, I think the reality, I'm definitely one of those people where that's not the case. You know, when I was younger, I did not, I actually thought maybe I'd be a lawyer. I didn't think I'd work in documentary TV production, I didn't even know that was a job. But I think to what I've learned is in the moments to be curious about my interest, what's possible and sort of reflective in the same way that Kelly was saying around, like, am I challenged? Am I growing? Um, for me, that's almost an intuitive, mm -hmm. reflective process and um, one thing we talked about as a group was this concept of the threshold, which is something that I've read a bunch about. This is like a space that's a space between spaces. So it's literally when we think about going through the door threshold, it's the space between two rooms. But in, you know, in theory and in a lot of religious practices and so forth, that's sort of literally a sacred space. And I love this mm -hmm. framework. For me, it's been helpful in thinking about moving from one thing to the next thing, that often that process is one of allowing the space to be uncomfortable and to be inquisitive and ask yourself the questions like, what is meaningful to me? What do I enjoy doing? Where is my unique purpose? What can I uniquely, what are my skill sets? How can I uniquely combine those to add value in my business, in my sphere? For me, increasingly, that series of questions came around mm -hmm. what's purpose driven for me how can I align mm -hmm. my sort of inner values with my work um, when I was younger I was more about where am I what am I passionate about and how can I find work that aligns with my passions and as I've gotten older the passions are aligning with purpose but mm -hmm. I think for me like running a successful business that I sold but then feeling that plateauing and not mm -hmm. then feeling the alignment around purpose was a time that intuitively I had to stop, start to ask myself a series of questions. And I sat in that space of kind of uncertainty for a long time until I felt, oh, I get it now. This is the moment to move mm -hmm. 
to move right. to the next thing when I decided to leave that business, which I loved, which was very successful and I could have kept doing, but it was not, it was not answering that question for me, which was, is it aligned? Is my work aligned with my internal values? Mm -hmm. No. Um, right. And right. so that was the next thing for me. And then mm -hmm. I had to ask myself, well, how could I, how could I create work and a business and an enterprise where those things were more aligned? And that led me to what I'm doing now, Every Woman Studio. So I think right. Right. sometimes the uncomfortability is just creating the space to ask the tough right. questions. And I would uh, another the immediate thought that I had as you're describing the threshold, Abby, and and sort of creating the sacred space. My initial thought was, we oftentimes think of learning by doing, learning by reading, learning by talking, but sometimes learning happens by stopping. Yeah, and this is the act sitting. of not doing. Exactly, and that is. I think for those of us who have been doers all of our life, and you know, gone gone to Wharton and applied for programs and you know done done all of our lives sometimes right. the act of not doing is where the important work right. of kind of lifelong learning and self-discovery comes in which right. i really believe and this is my own personal thing but i think when you can align your best purpose with your values and translate mm -hmm. that to work it it's kind of next level right um meaningfulness both in terms of the work that you're the product and the process right, right. exactly and and this this idea of a sacred space it, it can come in so many different environments and different settings my my first thought that i had was uh, steve jobs attending a calligraphy class uh, without actually having signed up for it. I think he just sort of showed up at Reed College <laughs> and sort of just sat in on the class. And ultimately it was learning for the sake of learning and there was no intent. There was no sort of desired outcome or output per se, but it was sacred space for, for him in that specific situation. Um, both of you have um, experienced the Wharton MBA as leaders, as executives. Can you share what that sacred space provided to you? If I were to sort of use the the executive MBA experience as a time to sort of sit and think, yeah. which I know you were provided. Yeah. What did that look like for you? Perhaps maybe Kelly, you can share your thoughts and Abby build upon that. Sure, yeah. And um, I love, I have to say, you know, I know when we were talking as a group uh, previously, Abby, you know, the idea of um, the threshold, right? The sac sacred space. I just, that to me, it really just touched me. I mean, I just loved what you were saying. Um, and so I started reading about it. I mean, after our last conversation, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So thank you so much, um, you know, for sharing that. And, um, and so, and this idea, it's interesting though, right? Because the idea of, um, you know, having a space where, I mean, you're, you're not doing, and it might seem counterintuitive that, um, you know, going and getting like your MBA, that that's not doing. And in a way, even though you're doing something, right, I still think it did give this opportunity. I mean, so I think using that as kind of the a container is interesting and um, and it kind of resonates because, but I think it was how, um, I think it was about how, to, how I approached it, I guess. But it wasn't initially, it was more at first thinking about the doing, kind of like Abby was saying, right? This idea of, you know, being productive, okay, I'm gonna get this and wh why am I doing this? I wanna get a certain, you know, experience in finance in particular, because I was thinking about Wharton mm -hmm. and that's what I wanna do. I wanna fill that kind of um, uh, where I felt like there was a gap for myself. But I remember actually um, one of the COOs um, at um, Wharton at the time had said to me, you know, she's like, Kelly, um, don't worry so much about like, okay, you, you're going to you know, major in finance or whatever, that that's like the gap you're trying to fill, fill right? She said, just do, you know, explore. <laughs> I mean, this is an opportunity, you know, take classes, learn from each other, just, just follow what you feel like is calling you, right? I mean, just mm -hmm. kind of explore, be open. And that is what I did. And so I kind of feel like in some ways that it really did turn out to be that sacred space, even though um, it was, you know, it was active, 
but not being so caught up in where is this all going, right? So thinking, okay, I'm getting, I'm going to get this MBA and then I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Just kind of learning. I mean, mm -hmm. literally just being curious, um, being able to take the experience. You know, you had mentioned, Alex, that um, it's not always about just new things. It's also be able to build on prior experience. And so it was amazing to be able to take this, um, you know, years of experience and then be in that environment and you start looking at things in different ways because you're able to take your prior experience and what you know, but then you're able to challenge your thinking because you're able to say, well, this is what I've been exposed to, but wow, now that I'm seeing this or hearing that, it created a whole new world. And I'll say, not just from the classroom learning, but really, frankly, it was from fellow classmates. I mean, you know, you learn so much um, from the diversity of perspectives but walking into it with that openness, just thinking, I don't know where this is gonna lead. Let me just see where it might lead. Let me just learn. And in the end, and I, you know, I know we'll be talking a little bit more um, later, I think about um, maybe some of our current pursuits, but that ultimately led me to what I'm doing now. But I think if I hadn't gone into it with that kind of um, feeling, going into it with uncertainty, going mm -hmm. into it, um, I had wouldn't have characterized it previously this way, but you know, when I hear Abby talk about the sacred space, I mean, it, it did feel that way um, mm -hmm. to me. And then it allowed me to just kind of reflect and think about past experience, current experience, learning from other people, where is, you know, kind of my heart, you know, not just mm -hmm. my mind being drawn to. Um, mm -hmm. So that, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's a really did uh, feel that way um, um, for me, that experience. That's interesting. Did, did you feel like the, the entrepreneurial seeds were planted? while you were in the program, Kelly? Just out of curiosity, or did you feel like that was a more immediate outcome and you felt like, okay, I knew at some, I know at some point I'm gonna start my own venture? Not necessarily. I mean, yeah, I feel like it, when I say not necessarily, meaning I didn't necessarily go in thinking, oh, I'm gonna start my own venture. In fact, I really right. didn't. And um, you know, I've said before that I kind of feel like I might've probably been one of the most unlikely entrepreneurs <laughs> maybe in my class. <laughs> Um, because I really did not go in with that um, thought per se, you know, I right. mean, of course, right. you're all, we're all have that little bit of interest, like, oh, what it might be like, but it, that was not the outcome I was seeking. I mean, I really was, um, uh, and when I hear even classmates talk about, you know, their ideas and stuff, I just thought, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think I'll, you know, it's kind of um, what Abby was saying, right, the stories that we tell ourselves. I think that was very powerful, mm -hmm. Abby, what you were saying. I mean, the stories we tell ourselves. And I think that was a story, you know, as kind of as I listened to classmates thinking, no, I don't think I'm not an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, so, yeah, but it was through that experience, those seeds do get planted. Um, and I think, again, every time you put yourself in this situation that feels kind of uncomfortable, it gives you the strength. Right. I mean, it gives you the courage to say, OK, well, maybe I could try this next thing because you've already right. been doing things that make you uncomfortable. And so this felt like over time, it, it didn't it seemed like, OK, a step that I could take, you know, mm -hmm. based on those past mm -hmm. experiences of um, right. learning and uncomfortable in that. Right. Right. And, and Abby, almost similar to sort of Kelly, you, your background is so unique um, coming sort of from the the creative space, if you will, Abby, and sort of now moving into uh, an environment where uh, in a way you you might be uh, in a way not to say alone but in, in, a, in a way sort of representing a sector that may not be as well represented how did the sacred space experience at Wharton look like for you what were some of the sort of the key learnings that maybe took place there where the threshold might you know the threshold contributing to the lifelong learning mindset sort of came to fruition there yeah I mean it's interesting we both Kelly and I talk about being Number one, we were both poets, right? Those are the right. people who are yeah. non-finance math folks. Um, <laughs> and then we also were sort of not necessarily the one at the going in that would thought would have thought we would have been entrepreneurs. Right. Um, I think that for me, I was also on the younger end when I went in. It was before I had kids and uh, before I was married. I think that that process of being totally immersed in something interestingly while we were talking it recurred to me what's cool about especially the exec program for me was you actually have everyone in that same mindset and process mm -hmm. because that's why they're there 
at the same time going through the same thing. So part of the bonding of it is we're all going on this journey together. We have different, you know, end goals and our journeys are different, but we're all here probably because we all want to learn something new. We're at a place in our careers where maybe we've stopped learning. Maybe we want to make, you know, a, a lateral move or a career, right. a total career jump. I mean, we had people in our group that changed industries. We had people right. moving from being scientists to CEOs. Um, so right. why did, I actually went in with the thought that I was on the creative side of the business and I wanted to have the business kind of kit toolbox so that people within the business would not view me as just a creative because mm. oddly enough in the um in the media world you can get billed as a creative or a suit yes right one or the other here i am wearing a suit right. but my whole thing was like i'm neither one nor the other i'm both and right. that i wanted to have that toolbox but also i wanted to be seen internally within my company as somebody who had that right. toolbox. So right. It was interesting though, while that was my goal going in, like my sort of transformation moment was actually took me on a different journey, which was not only am I not just a, you know, a creative or a suit, I'm an entrepreneur, like, which is, right. Right. I then threw out my suits, you know, donned my jeans and mm -hmm. <laughs> ran my yeah. own company. Um, that's not something that I was a goal going in at all. And I, right. but I found myself drawn to those classes. I love those set of problems. Right. Um, and it's interesting. And I think I, I told you all this anecdote, but when I was in my own threshold and contemplating what I wanted to do to, to continue my journey, when I was, I had sold my company called Happy Yard Productions, which I'd run for like 14, 15 years and mm -hmm. was running it still as the CEO. And um, I was contemplating making a change and I happened to come back to my home office and find one of my Wharton assignments from my entrepreneurial professor where I had to write a Time Magazine article about myself 50 years from now. And the article I wrote was called Myself as the CEO of a company called SheTV that made female focused content. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. It's always been in there. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I, I literally had written the story in this case, you know, 20 plus years prior. The vision right. was there, but I didn't know how to right. achieve it. And here I was all these years later. I've now started this female centered right. media company. Right. Um, and right. so in a way, I'm achieving, you know, writing or living the story that I wrote earlier. But that came yeah. from, I think, that intense moment and time when you could really explore what most fulfilled you like both right. intellectually and with your colleagues and we all kind of challenged each other mm -hmm. in that phase yeah. i think to yeah and, and and coached each other too like in my right. cohort of classmates um i started my business half yard productions after two of my study group colleagues who i went up on the train right every other week from DC to Penn, mm -hmm. um, two of them had started their own businesses before I started mine. And, you know, yeah. I had many a conversation with them before I started Half Yard. They gave me their spreadsheet of to-do lists mm -hmm. and some of their <laughs> contacts. And I think that was part of knowing that my colleagues, you know, had gone into the void before me, like, yeah. if they could do it, I could do it. And right. that's part of that culture of, it's that culture of lifelong learning and bravery that, yeah. you know, if you can tap into it and be in it, can make you just a better person, I think. Right. We're open it's to getting... risk taking, to taking change. You know, they're, they're calculated risk, but somehow it feels less scary right. when you have others doing right. it. Right. Right. Yeah. It sort of goes back to this idea of how do you um, overcome the discomfort of continuous learning, in a sense. And you're hitting on a number of points, Abby, as well as you, Kelly, um, the unintentional um, learning that happens, um, those train rides with your colleagues, your classmates, you're unintentionally learning 
things that you didn't have the intention of learning when you decided to pursue the the program and the unintentional learning is also combined with the fact that both Kelly, you and Abby, you made a commitment to be part of a diverse set of people. And this could be, I think, a broader discussion that I don't think half an hour will will allow us to. But I want us to talk about this. I think it's very important that we realize that sometimes we unintentionally are in positions where there are diversity in backgrounds, diversities in, in perspectives, professionally, culturally, religiously, gender, et cetera. And that we are learning without necessarily even thinking that we're learning right. from those that are part of this world that don't look like us, didn't train like we did. Um, I have a biology background and, um, you know, typically, you know, as a South Asian, Indian American, first generation, my I had two pathways in my life that I was aware of, which was either I'd become a doctor or an engineer. And I was fortunate to have convinced my father to uh, give me two years to do Teach for America in Harlem. That's when I realized I was pretty good at sales, <laughs> pitching that to my dad. Um, but I'm surrounded by people of Dominican descent. I'm surrounded by those that I'm experiencing life with for the first time, you know, both my collaborators, my teachers, educators. Um, I learned so much without the intention and I realized in a classroom that I did have an entrepreneurial passion. I'm bringing that up because I want us to talk about the importance of diversity when it comes to lifelong learning and some of the unintentional learnings that take place. And both of you have very mission-driven organizations. So what is the importance of having exposure to diversity and and my understanding might be quite limiting i'd love to hear how lifelong learning mindset plays into diversity and broader perspectives perhaps maybe kelly and abby you can both speak to that what does that look like for you what would you like to share from what you have done in your professional career sure yeah um you know i want to um Thank you for that, Alex, and um, also for the experience, sharing the experience about Teach for America. I think that's a great example, right? I mean, of um, you were talking about, you know, unintentional um, kind of these opportunities where you end up learning, and then there's also the ability to do it in an intentional way. Um, I do want to actually also kind of pick up on something that Abby you had mentioned about um, the bravery, right? I mean, that being around your classmates, um, you know, taking those train rides. Um, it gives you the bravery, right? I mean, so it's not, I think that's so important because, um, you know, it can sound like, you know, when we talk about, okay, you know, stepping out there, you know, always stretching yourself, but there's others involved, right? I mean, again, so you think about, when I talk about my mentor, I mean, he kind of, you know, helped push me, get out there, but similarly, um, you know, your classmates or whatever environment you might put yourself in, Teach for America, right? I mean, you know, the people around you, I mean, you might be going into an uncertain territory. What are you doing? You know, how how do I teach? You know, how do I do this? Um, so that that's so important that, you know, the bravery, um, I, I think that you, that you get from that support from others who have gone before you um, is so important. And I think it also ties to diversity too, right? Because, um, the more I, I, the you know, differences, different perspectives, different backgrounds, um, different experiences that we um, can surround ourselves with, it's it. I think it it can give us even more bravery because we're able to see things from different perspectives. You know, we're one person. I mean, I sometimes feel like a little ant. I mean, if you really think mm -hmm. about the world, right, and all the knowledge that's out there, and all the experiences, and all the opportunities to learn from each other. And I think learning from each other, going back to what Abby had said about stories, the stories we tell ourselves, also though, those, in, in addition, the stories we hear from others, their, expect, their, pers their perspectives, their experiences they've been through um, uh, that might be very different from our own, those stories can help us tell ourselves new stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, as well as what, what is what I found. And so um, on the diversity front, I mean, it's, yeah, I can't overemphasize just how important, obviously, right? I mean, that's my, my life's work, but, um, but it is so true. So not only the unintentional, these opportunities where it's kind of serendipitous, where we have these opportunities to learn across our differences, right. but also intentionally. I mean, so, mm -hmm. so one of the things that, um, 
I'm obsessed with like the research, right? I mean, I'm always like just <laughs> reading, reading, learning, trying to learn, you know, trying to understand, trying to find solutions, practical ways um, for us to build, um, you know, bridges across our divides. But one of the things, and one of the things I've learned through that is this idea of intentionality when it comes to placing ourselves in different experiences with different people. Um, oftentimes we'll say that we can't um, include each other if we're not interacting with each other, right? I mean, you know, right. we talk about inclusion, right. but it's kind of interacting. And as human beings, we tend to gravitate to people who are like us, you know, whether that's like-minded, whether it's similar culture, whatever it might be. I mean, we all do that as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have to, um, you know, think about, you know, are there opportunities? What are opportunities that we can design for ourselves? Like literally designing these opportunities for us to interact with people who might be different from ourselves. So whether that's, you know, going back and pursuing, um, you know, additional education, whether it's MBA or otherwise, whether it's Teach for America, whatever it might be, um, it's just, you know, being able to put ourselves and really think about it, like being more really intentional about creating these opportunities for us to interact across our differences. It right. creates just like you talk about lifelong learning. Oh, right. That's lifelong learning. Right. I mean, it, it, it's like every day you have this opportunity if you if you can kind of take that kind of mindset of thinking, OK, how do I place myself in different um, situations? How do I design these opportunities for me to interact with people who are different from myself? And then have, mm. um, and then you know, think about how do I actually learn, you know, across these differences. It's it's really, um, right. it, it's a it's a great perspective to have. Yeah, yeah. Intentionally putting oneself in a, a, an environment to learn from other perspectives is 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 so critical. I appreciate sharing that, Kelly. And so, Abby, you know, obviously from from your perspective, you you've led media companies. You've dedicated your life's work to enabling female driven stories to be told how does that relate to you know your mission in a sense and and this importance of have, having that story be told from this um persona why is that important for lifelong learning for the industry that you're in but even broader speaking um, beyond just the media entertainment space i'd love to hear your perspectives on that i mean i think about the my business is a business of ideas right and mm -hmm. and i think actually a lot of businesses ultimately it's like how are you bringing in innovation right. new ideas to market whether it's to market or within your company new products what have you so in my business the sort of trade and business of ideas really flows from the producer who has the ideas to the distributor who gets them to consumers so the problem there in my business it's a, because it's a very gate kept business the diverse ideas never get they might get created but they don't get out to the consumer because they're not seen financed or made so mm -hmm. part of what um my fix to that and speaking to this question of where lifelong learning meets diversity and inclusion um we started this accelerator program for women creators and the purpose of that was actually designing a very intentional process whereby we put up and coming female creators particularly a focus on diverse creators who are women who have great ideas um, but that don't have the access to get them pitched sold and made and so we're kind of I totally agree with Kelly that sometimes when a system's broken, you can't just like will it to being better. You have to intentionally design something to create a new pathway. So in this program mm -hmm. also, we intentionally recruited mentors who help workshop these ideas of female creators. We particularly um, brought in mentors who themselves were very successful women in the business, but also from diverse backgrounds and perspectives because it was important to have, to show um, to the to our sort of industry community of people that they were the mentors in this program, but also as a design of a, of a program, I think it fosters like interesting idea ideation, right? To have somebody of a different perspective mentoring and workshopping a project. So 
I think um, it's been interesting for me to see this. It's almost like a very kind of democratized form of idea innovation. You know, kind of right. if you think about computing and how they move from like a centralized model to, I'm not a computer right. science person, but to like decentralized, like we could all have a personal computer and we can all, um, it's sort of a democratized form of that. In a way, what this accelerator program does is it kind of, it democratizes that. So it says like, bring us your ideas and then we're going to take the the ideas and the creators who don't have access and help get them there. Right. Right. Um, so that's a very intentionally designed program. Mm. And I think, at least in my business, and I'd venture in many others, without those intentional programs, you just won't get the in my in my business the diversity of ideas, the diversity of creators in 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 the mix, which which has the end benefit of having shows content where all of us can see ourselves in the content. Mm-hmm. That's the end goal of what my business is about is just obviously with the female lens, like I want to show the full range of the experience of of being a woman in in content like that can show up in all kinds of different ways and look all kinds of different ways and so forth but anyway we can't it's not going to just happen because i want it to happen so right um and i'm sure kelly would agree with this whether it's the legal sphere the media sphere any of these spheres like there's a reason why we haven't gotten there yet so I think this idea of like what's everyone's equivalent process and their business teams sphere industry where they can mm-hmm. intentionally design programs, teams, initiatives to foster more diverse set of experience, like mm-hmm. on a team, you know, if you're trying to right. come up with a new product or idea or in an initiative or what have you, or in your C-suite or whatever, you can mm-hmm. take the, that model and apply it elsewhere. And I'll say one final thing, which actually comes from my 16 year old daughter, but this kind of blew my mind. Um, she read this book called Emergent Strategy and the concept of this, it actually comes from biology, like the woman who oh. read it is a scientist. So she took her in, inspiration from things like bird murmurations, you know, swallow mm. murmurations where one swallow moves with the whole and the concept is there about how not one individual can't change something but the group as a whole can by sort of moving in tandem Mm. so the idea and the metaphor here is that change like if you want to change culture change your business change anything um we have to reflect the values we want to see in our reflected in our actual workplace so this idea of Mm -hmm. like fractals which is a scientific con construct biological construct this is for you Alex yeah it's like we want to mirror the things that we want to see in my case like gender equity and diversity etc so Mm -hmm. I need to make sure in the design of my workplace that we have a mix of perspectives and opinions and things like that so I'm literally mirroring you know Mm -hmm. and on the teams the individual teams that are making my shows yes I need to make sure you know, the person who's in charge, the team that's working on it, they don't all, they actually shouldn't all be women necessarily, right? Because right. And they shouldn't all be the same. So it's this idea of how do you take your values and literally practically mm. design systems and teams and structures, in my case, in the workplace, to make better content. It's like a kind of radical right. idea, which my right. daughter told me about, but it kind of blew my mind. It's like... It- concept of mirroring our values in our systems and in our lives it's a pretty cool idea yeah yeah it starts within and it sort of exudes outside of just exactly. ourselves yeah. and in just a, I, I was i was just trying to find some research around the importance of diversity and it's sort of building yeah. upon what you both have described as well as one of the questions that came from an attendee so i'll start with the data this I'm is from a McKinsey out of, report. Out of the blinding light oh, gang. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Totally uh, shift around. We're My all light has shifted. Into that. <laughs> um, yeah, no worries, no worries. This McKinsey study, I was just trying to figure out if there's any data around 
at the executive leadership level, what is the impact financially for businesses that have a diverse executive leadership? Yeah. And I and I promise this will come back to our, our discussion. I might be mistaken in terms of my interpretation, but we'll be sure to send this link over to all the registrants so that they have it. From what I understand, the, the report by McKinsey says that companies are, as of 2019, so this one's a slightly outdated one, but a company is 36% more likely to outperform if they have true diversity at the executive leadership level. That was my conclusion from what I saw in the data as we were talking. Um, the main point is the greater the diversity, one could argue greater exchange of knowledge and information from different perspectives, and that will then lead to a better performing business. Now, are we at the point where we can say companies are adequately striving for diversity? I would argue no. I think we can all look at data around that and make our own judgments. Um, putting, this, putting, putting this in the context of lifelong learning, importance of lifelong learning, not just within ourselves. Those that are attending this session are leading in you know, specific companies. They're yeah. leading global business units. How do we those that are attending, again, have a natural appreciation for lifelong learning. That's why we're all together. That's why we all pursue, uh, in many cases, a degree at, at an executive level. How do we take this importance that we're placing on lifelong learning, what's bringing us here, and spread that amongst our organizations, amongst our communities, and even broader? So any, any suggestions, Abby, you were hinting upon that importance of having a group of people that are on board with this idea of exchange of ideas. So perhaps maybe we can discuss that in a little bit more detail. What does, what, it's more of the, the how do we do it as opposed to, I think, why. I think we all know that's important. So how do we go about doing that? Have your Kelly, feel free to jump in. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, Abby, were you going to no, say I'm something? Gest I'm gesturing to Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Um, so a couple of things. Okay, so building on, you know what Abby was saying about the idea, you know, in your teams, et cetera. Um, so I'm trying to, could I could kind of go off? I'm trying to organize my thoughts here. So um, that is number one, right? So if you think about leaders, like from a practical standpoint, what what you can do. You know what what Abby was saying is so true. Um, as leaders, right? I mean, one of the key skills, this idea of not only role modeling, <laughs> this idea of um, mm -hmm the learning through diversity. And I'll say, um, you know, this actually t does tie to research as well. You had mentioned, Alex, about the McKenzie study. There is research, McKenzie, there's uh, Cedric Herring, the late Cedric Herring, he did some phenomenal research, uh, statistical analysis, you know, looking at um, uh, hundreds of companies uh, and performance, you know, key performance indicators and mapping that to the diversity of these companies. And, you know, he could see, looking at gender diversity, um, race and ethnic diversity, uh, differences, positive differences in revenue, profitability, et cetera. So the, the data, it's there, um, and including on the create, um, creativity side, you know, Abby was talking about um, this idea, you know, diversity. I mean, one of the um, out, outcomes um, is innovation, right? Or you're looking for that. And we also know from research, uh, from really actually years of research across many different dimensions, um, mm -hmm. um, economics, uh, uh, psychology, sociology, various different fields um, that do show this idea that uh, diversity can um, increase and, and spark creativity and innovation. All that being said, though, I mean, I think it still comes back down to, you know, Alex, and you were, you were, you were, you know, mentioning this, kind of tying the idea of performance um, outcomes to coming back to the learning, right? This learning mindset that um, that's kind of the input, right? Where you can get those other outputs. And I think sometimes we become so focused on, um, and again, the data is good. I mean, the data are good. I mean, it's good to have that information. You want to have mm -hmm. that insight. Um, but you know, if we say, okay, if we have more diversity, we're going to increase, you know, our revenue, our profits, or whatever it might be, um, our performance. But what we also know from research is that if you just take, if you say, okay, we're going to just bring everyone together, and then that's it. Actually, there can also be negative impacts. I mean, you have mm. to. It has, it has to be this idea that we are genuinely wanting to learn across our differences, 
And then how do we facilitate that learning? How do we manage that diversity? If you think about from a leadership perspective, right? Mm -hmm. But the learning mindset, and we actually know from research as well in terms of diversity, that those organizations that treat diversity as a learning resource, mm. more people feel more included. They feel like they belong. Work teams, uh, work team functioning improves. So there's research on that in particular, how critical this idea is of the learning mindset and learning through diversity, how many benefits that we can get through that. Um, but it really is critical. I mean, I think that's such an important part because I remember, um, you know, one researcher mentioning it's not just like kind of take diversity, mix and stir. I mean, it really mm -hmm. is the intentionality. I mean, in thinking about and approaching it. I mean, if you think about it, when, how does it feel when we feel that someone wants to learn from us? Right. I mean, it's like one of the greatest compliments, right? I mean, if someone wants to learn from us, um, my brother um, who works with me will often say, you know, if you want to learn about me, learn from me. And so, um, so this idea of learning, right, that the diversity, it's not diversity in the abstract. It's actually that we're wanting to learn from our diversity, learning mm -hmm. from our different perspectives. That's the richness. And that's where, as you had mentioned, Alex, you start getting to, you know, some of those outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, you know, going back to what Abby had said, said about, you know, actually intentionally designing for that, designing for these opportunities, um, uh, for diversity and designing for those opportunities to actually learn across our differences as well. Right. The the the, the relationship between learning, diversity, and business outcome is is becoming more clear in many ways. And so, Abby, perhaps you can build upon Kelly's point of mm -hmm. how did you intentionally create that environment where learning could take place, having the intention to have different perspectives in the room. Yeah, I mean, one other frame of this that I think is worth mentioning mm -hmm. is that we know that the consumer is diverse, right? Yes. Um, and varied. So if you flip it, I mean, this was one of the thesis that led me to start this new company that I'm running now, which was that for years in the media business, at least, there was a sense that the female consumer wasn't as valued as the male consumer. Mm. That at least in the media business, like when I was, uh, you know, ran content for a cable network, um, we sold the male audience at a premium as compared to the female audience. There are a number of reasons as to why that is. Um, but this is changing because mm. our, the realities of the consumer are changing more diverse consumers are driving markets and certainly women as consumers have more buying power in the market you know they mm -hmm. make more product decisions and have more earning power um like inherited wealth earned wealth all these things more women in the market same for diverse uh consumers so when you that's another frame to this idea meaning like it's just good business to have the people in your business represent the diversity of the consumer because mm. guess what they're going to know more about what the consumer wants are what the consumer right. desires are and that goes for you know age and experiences as well so it's something i keenly think about because i'm always wanting to have people and myself kind of have a have a pulse on what the end consumer who's going to watch the content that i'm making but mm. I want to resonate with them. So part of this thesis is, well, you know, we need to have more diverse and varied and interesting ideas because also those will be the ideas that will resonate better with consumers. Like when you see a character portrayal that's really interesting and compelling and complex, you know, whether that's a movie or a scripted series or an unscripted one, a documentary, like I think people I think that actually makes it more entertaining, more compelling. It makes you lean in more. So for me as a storyteller, it's actually like getting this part of it right actually results in better content. And for the kind of ecosystem for my business that I'm trying to create, like if I'm a brand partner, I'm going to want to be affiliated with content that better represents the end consumer who I'm trying to reach with my messages. If I'm a distributor, like I'm going to want to feel good about 
like the content has to resonate. It's got to rate. People need to want to have it. But it's a kind of virtuous cycle. So I think for all of us at some level, we have end consumers in our businesses that we need to think about. So that's another way of thinking about this concept of diversity and inclusion is like, again, mirroring your mm. consumer in your business. Right. Like for a long time, we've just had, that's been very uncalibrated, right? So how right. do we right. do that? How do you get closer to your consumer by being closer to your makeup of your consumer base in your company? Right. And it, it's sort of the, 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 the term reverse engineering is, is yeah. sort of coming to mind in a way who are, who are, you serving as an organization how do you represent that in your leadership and in your organization right. and then right. uh, allow for the space for different perspectives to be heard and then to allow for i was interesting right before our, our discussion this morning we were in a strategy session um one of our colleagues is based in utah um he's 38 years old has a very unique and i'm 37 myself and um he has a very different background com compared to my upbringing um, in the Northeast. He has four children. I have two boys that are under three. And we felt safe in having friction. And I call it sort of this learning through friction. And um, he's a relatively new addition to our team. He's in a senior leadership role. Um, and I wanted to make sure he felt a certain level of comfort to disagree and to be passionate about it and to listen and it sort of goes back to that point i'm sort of taking a microscopic perspective of the the sacred space and the threshold i as someone that's been invested in this venture for 15 years i had to force myself to stop and just listen and to hear my colleague's perspective who's only been with us for three weeks and to then soak it in as opposed to reacting and saying, oh, you know what, we've tried that and it doesn't really work, you know. Right. Um, and that is so important, sort of holding ourselves back as leaders. Discomfort was all throughout my bones in a way, but I, I had to sort of force myself to sort of pause, um, yeah. learning by pausing in a sense, every, right? So Every business case we study was littered with people where it's like, ah, we tried that, we did that, that won't work. I mean, in my business, it's like, oh, you know, right. No one wa no one will watch shows about cephalopods, and then you have like my octopus teacher becomes an Oscar winning movie. And also, <laughs> right. you know, it's like, where's our octopus film? You know, where's our yeah. so you know that those right. kind of stories are littered everywhere. Where you need somebody, you need that new voice in the business to be like, no, right. This is a cool story. In my case, like right. Right. You should listen to this. And just as you say, I think when you're like, if you're a legacy founder of a company or we all have our own view of what, of what we think will work mm -hmm. as an idea or a product or what have you. So I think, yeah, it's right. important that people right. challenge that and right. not just set up a culture where you're, you're just going to like hear people echo back to you the ideas that you think are great, but yeah, like exactly. it's really bringing different perspectives to the table and that's right yeah you know, that's sort of what new ideas look like it's like you're you're right. going to be earlier to that market or um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly exactly and so no this is this is fantastic I, I i wish we could continue uh we we only have a minute or two left and and um i want first want to thank all of our attendees that have been listening in we've had a number of questions that have been able to sort of share with you building upon the discussion that we have had and um, i think the key takeaway for me and i'd love to kelly and abby for you to also perhaps say your final thoughts before we close out um the importance of the unintentionality married with the intentionality when it comes to learning is so critical and important how do we apply that for ourselves and for those that we're leading as leaders um, I think that's a question that still we can develop an answer to in a dialogue within our organizations. I hope that all of us can take that away. Um, that's something that I've learned from our discussion. Perhaps Kelly, you can share your thoughts and, and Abby thereafter and we'll we'll close from that point forward. Kelly, final thoughts? Okay. Thank you, Alex. I think I'm gonna uh, build on what you're saying about the uh, intentional and the unintentional. Uh, unintentional. Um, but the idea it's like designing um and what abby was saying about designing designing for serendipity 
right? I mean, and just from a practical standpoint, um, you know, kind of a takeaway as, you know, leaders um, who may be attending this program, designing your meetings, right? I mean, you know, thinking about how do you design meetings? Um, not only who do you include in your meetings, but how do you design the meetings? How do you design meetings so that new voices, new ideas can, you know, kind of bubble up? So that might mean, you know, before a meeting, asking for input, um, but, you know, you know there's a question you're going to ask, at soliciting input mm. before a meeting, because different people have different styles. We have different processing times. You know, some people feel more comfortable speaking up in a group. Someone may not. But just thinking about that, right, appointing dissenting views, you know, appointing a couple people to serve as dissenters during a meeting. So just thinking, you know, as leaders, what are some of the ways um, that I can facilitate, you know, this um, kind of these hearing from new voices, um, you know, generating ideas, designing for serendipity, I guess you could say. Um, mm. Because, you know, as leaders, we really have that ability not only to role model, but to facilitate that. And so I would just leave that. So meetings is one place, you know, kind of where, where we can start. Very helpful. Thank you, Kelly. Really appreciate your time and, and your attention to our discussion. Abby, any final words for you? Um, well, I would say as I'm making manifest the comfortability uncomfortable because if you can tell I'm getting like <laughs> right. you're getting um, beamed in. <laughs> <laughs> but what I would say is I think it's very it's something that I struggle with but I think is worth putting out there is like what are you doing that you need to stop doing mm. or what work are you doing that you need to stop doing that is not servicing your growth or your end goals so in order to make room for growth, sometimes you need to clear space and energy for that new thing to emerge. So mm. it's like, instead of a to-do list, what's the not to-do list? Like to be really, to interrogate what you need to stop doing to make, to allow the growth to begin that, that for the lifelong learning that we all want. That's my parting thought. Very, very well put, Abby. And, and which, which kind of I, echoes which I love like the design for to allow for serendipity it's kind of yeah like thinking about that on a personal level as well so yeah. that's my yeah. parting notion yeah no it, it's it's has been an incredible discussion Kelly Abby and and as I mentioned I feel like this could be a there could be a part two a part three to this and and I personally am looking forward to continuing our conversations we hope that those of you that have joined us can take what we have brought forth and build upon our discussion. And again, we appreciate everyone's time. We look forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, expect a recording to be in your inbox in the next day or two. And again, thank you, Abby Kelly. Really appreciate the, the conversation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Abby. Bye, everyone. Be well. Bye. Bye.